partner and we're live. Hello, ah. Dr. Rachel. Hello, Dr. Alexis. How are you today? I'm really well. Thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm really well. Thank you. Really well. We're both in our casual Sunday gear, I noticed. Yeah, and we're slightly matchy-matchy. Bit of brown, a bit of uh, 70s, you know, kind of, it works for us. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's we're go. allowed to say that ourselves yes, let's go with that now sorry we're running a few minutes late I did put a post saying we would be running a few minutes late and I'm just trying to make sure that we are live it's not coming up on my yes it is showing uh on my on Facebook I will just refresh so that I can see people's comments because I thought today with our topic we could jump in early you can introduce the topic in a sec and ask people for some examples of our topic. What do you think? Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, just to let you know, I need to keep it um, to right to 4.30 or let's say 4.33 because okay. uh, it's my daughter's birthday. Oh, so yeah. okay. on with the show, today is yeah. quite a fundamental topic. Uh, again, relevant to all of us and uh, it's on coercion and punishment. And uh, I'm interested in hearing about your definitions of punishment and coercion, how they manifest in our culture, how they manifest in our well-being, and the alternatives uh, of which, yeah, of which there are indeed alternatives. So, um, where would you like to start, Dr. Rachel? Yeah, well, let's let's talk about punishment. It's a little bit different to coercion, and obviously they go together, and both of them are still undercurrents in many parts of our culture, as you've said. Yes. So let's talk about the psychology of punishment, first of all, and then we can come back to coercion. And then I'd like to ask our listeners for any examples in their lives where they've subtly, and it's almost always subtle, subtly punished others or subtly or not so subtly punished themselves. So think about that as you're listening. Um, and uh, first of all, I want to normalize um, the, the kind of punishment thinking and mindset. It's so common and we all grew up receiving, you know, punishments or consequences. And the psychology of punishment is a desire to instill shame or hurt in another person. Now, of course, that sounds terrible when you say it out loud, that we want somebody else to feel ashamed or to feel pain or hurt in some way. But as Byron Katie says, hurt people hurt people. Um, and so all of us at times when we've been really hurting in some way, whether it's overwhelm, feeling ashamed ourselves, feeling angry, feeling incompetent, feeling really hurt, um, any kind of pain or hurt, we want to, our instincts are to discharge pain, right? And one of the ways we discharge physiological arousal and pain is, you know, through a kind of primal expression of it. And one of those primal expressions can be punishment. And very often in this society, it's not physical aggression, it's more emotional or verbal aggression, um, but it doesn't even have to be aggression. Sometimes punishments can be kind of very passive aggressive. Um, and now just to ground it and contextualize it, you know, we still see this in our corrective services, our justice system. We still see this in our education system. And what I want to focus on today is the psychology of punishment because Prisons exist and sometimes we need to keep people in them to protect society. Schools exist and they must have rules because the rules help create safety and equality. But the mindset of the people who work and exist in those institutions um, can be punitive, can be focused on punishment, so making someone else feel bad, or it can be one of compassion. Now we know that compassion is much more conscious, much more deliberate, takes a lot of conscious awareness to practice it when we're feeling very hurt or stressed. And our instincts often implore us to lash out or to you know, punish, to gain back a sense of control in our lives by taking away something from somebody else or putting them in a less powerful 
position, a more powerless position in some way. We can see teachers do this to students. Still, parents do this to kids. I've punished my kids. I don't feel good about that. I don't think I've done it for a long time now. But um, and I and I've been punishing towards other people in my life. So I want to say that so I can start from a position of shared humanity. Like this is not just other people. This is all of us who engage in subtle forms of punishment. And then let's talk about self-punishment because so often we turn that anger, blame, criticism and shame back in on ourselves. This is actually so much more common and we take a punitive or punishing attitude towards ourselves for our mistakes and wrongdoings. Mm -hmm. And then we want to coerce, this is where coercion comes in, coerce ourselves pressure and force ourselves and should on ourselves in order to create change in ourselves in some way and we all know the pain that that leads to and how it can ultimately be ineffective and if it is effective it's probably not sustainable in the long run and I've spoken for long enough now and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts that is Such a great introduction. I didn't know this was such a, I mean, I understand it's a huge part of NBC, but you're you're so across this, Dr. Rachel. Um, What I'm hearing, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it's it's a normal instinct uh, to, you know, it's a survival mechanism when we're feeling stressed or we're feeling threatened, we're in that hyper arousal state to want to control, Mm -hmm. to give ourselves, you know, a peace of mind. And so there is a place for it is what I'm hearing. Rules and safety and equality is a healthy manifestation. uh, Yeah, but that's not, but that's not punishment. That's um, structures to try and create safety and equality. Punishment to my my view is punishment never works very well. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's I think it's natural in that and it well it's human and it's common, but I don't think it's effective ever really. So really it's up to us to be able to bring things down again so that we can enter into that place of compassion. That's what I'm hearing. And we're not saying uh, ditch the rules we're saying there is a place for rules of course for safety and equality but ultimately to react or respond uh, from that stress response is never going to lead to a positive outcome i don't think it's i don't it's never effective at creating more connection Mm -hmm. and if our goal is connection and mutuality and understanding which you know I think of most of us unless we're like biologically hardwired psychopaths most of us if we really come down to it we want connection we want belonging we want mutuality in our relationships Mm -hmm. and you know punishment and coercion which is that tendency to want to force um it's a demand you know basically like you should you must you have to or there'll be punishment so coercion often comes before punishment what I wanted to get get across I guess is that this is very human it's been in all cultures for all of human history Uh, and that doesn't mean it's good (laughs) just because it's very human doesn't mean it's effective and I do think that humans have this capacity to rise above those more primitive instincts it's not to dishonor those primitive instincts but to see which ones add value and help us and which ones cause more suffering and in my experience punishment always causes more suffering thank you for an exceptional introduction uh there's a an example that's coming to mind because i see a lot of clients who come in for weight loss And there is absolutely a conditioning. I'm thinking of one client recently in particular who came to me about six months ago with a very uh, clear mindset of punishment. And she wanted to to do a weight loss program. She'd done done Jenny Craig, she'd done shakes, she'd done a personal training, all of which had worked. But as you said, they weren't sustainable. They'd worked for a period of time and then she'd just gained weight again in the months following. And so we did, uh, she chose to do one of my programs called the Doable Detox Program, which is holistic and incorporates uh, really reflecting on our own beliefs about our bodies, our relationship to food, our relationship to movement and um, elements, strong elements of self-compassion. And uh, she is now successfully uh, a sustainable weight that she's very happy with. And this is now, as I said, six months later, but 
I don't think it's possible to lose weight sustainably with a mindset of punishment. That's what I've seen in, in more than 15 years of clinical practice. And it's strongly ingrained in both the, the weight loss, the fitness, the nutrition industry. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, th I think it's, it's rife. And it's everywhere. Often know another way. So. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. I mean, Mia has left a comment here a few minutes ago saying, I punish myself when I open up to somebody about my emotions on a deep level. The narrative, narrative is I shouldn't have done that. Now that person's going to think differently about me. So, you know, it's everywhere. Our inner critic rises up and punishes us mm -hmm. and says, you know, you should lose weight. You shouldn't feel this way. You shouldn't be so vulnerable. You shouldn't be angry. You shouldn't be scared. You shouldn't be sad. You know, you should have handled that better. You know, <laughs> there's so many shoulds and it's self-punishment. It's self-punishment and it leads to more shame, which leads to more self-punishment, which leads to more shame. And it's a vicious cycle and we need to find a way to break it um, and the antidote is empathy or compassion. Yes, very nice. So just before you move into empathy and compassion, are you saying that people, our listeners and all of us can use uh, that recognition of the should that we're telling ourselves as a, as a flag for mm. an area that we're using self-punishment? Is that your suggestion, Rachel? It's, it's a flag and for many of us, it's our modus operandi. So it's hard to see flags when it's like flag, 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 flag. You know, so many of us in this I culture, hear you. I hear we, you. we live and some days are worse than others for most of us, but we can have whole days where our mind is consumed with self-punishment, self-criticism, should thinking, blame, judgment, um, towards ourselves that can seep out and go on to others but then it comes back to ourselves again um, and for many people this is their MO yeah. so there's a lot of work to do here in terms of learning a more compassionate mindset because compassion is the antidote to it's like the opposite of blame judgment and criticism mm -hmm. compassion doesn't say should compassion says why has this happened? What's going on? What are you feeling? What is needed here? You know, compassion has a very different kind of voice, mm -hmm. asks very different questions. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but this is a big piece of work for many of us to find people in our lives who will hold us with compassion and acceptance in our pain and mm -hmm. holding ourselves in compassion instead of in this self-punishment it's just so rife well so what i'm hearing is it's transgenerational as well as in it's been passed down really at least from our grandparents parents to us and then uh hopefully it ends hopefully it ends with us but uh it seems to be about our values and really yes. finding ways to hold our values ourselves and um, find others who reflect that enough that we can build some momentum behind it. It's about four or 5,000 years old in the culture, according to some sociologists that I've read. Yeah, wow. So we've been doing this punishment and coercion thing in a big way for about four or 5,000 years hmm. um, since agricultural revolution really took off and our society became very hierarchical and power over Traditional societies operate under less coercion and punishment than modern societies. I would like to ask our listeners, before we go on to talk about compassion practice, if anyone would like to share, what are the subtle ways that you've punished yourself or others? Because this can be so subtle that we don't even recognize it as punitive. So if you have any ideas, if you're listening, what are some of the subtle ways you punish yourself? thoughts that you think actions that you take that are self-punishing and what are the subtle ways that you punish other people if you're willing to be really honest do you ghost them do you ignore them do you put salt in their coffee instead of sugar no I'm just joking what do you do though holding back a subtle holding back I yeah it comes to my mind when you say that 
Yes. So I wonder, oh, someone said being silent. Kim said being silent. Yeah, the silent treatment is a form of subtle punishment. That's very common. It's such a big topic. I really like this one. Stephanie says not eating. Yeah, so there's ways we punish ourselves with food, either withholding or overindulging. Same with drugs and alcohol. We can, like anything, we can use these things for our enjoyment or we can use them for um, more destructive purposes. About the intention then, you know, why we're doing something. Exactly. And that answers uh, Stephanie's question, what's the difference between putting boundaries up and punishing someone? It's all about intention, as you say, Alexis. What's your yeah. intention? Yeah, even rewards. I'm wondering whether, you know, whether rewards and incentive may have, uh, you know, that, that kind of swinging effect. What do you find? Yeah, well, I mean, it's like, what's the intention behind reward? Traditionally, it's to kind of make the person do that thing again. That's yeah. why we reward dogs, which is fine, because they're dogs, and we want them to, you know, shake hands again. Mm. But with children, the modern advice is if a child shows you their painting, mm. um, then instead of giving them a lolly and telling them that it's beautiful, you might say, you know, I really like it. Do you like it? What do you think of it? You know, you kind of want to um, have them bring the enjoyment and satisfaction and pride back into themselves, which is different to reward. Reward places the power outside of us, as does punishment. Mm -hmm. But what, And that's a power over model. But mm -hmm. what compassion and um, empathy do is they are a power with model, a shared power model. Well, I have the power to say to the child, I really like it. I think it's beautiful. What do you think? You know, do, do you feel pleased with yourself? So that there's this sharing in the satisfaction rather than the reward energy or the punishment energy. I don't know if that answers your question. It does. It does. And um, that's been my experience too. If I'm using a reward, it's because I'm not getting satisfaction from the thing that I'm doing and rather place emphasis on, on the task at hand, what values it meets, you know, connect with something more meaningful than a, a reward, which implies that what I'm doing is not <laughs> enjoyable. It's not satisfying. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So it lacks that intrinsic motivation. A few other answers in the comments. Mia says, I withdraw. So withholding food, starvation, over-exercising, mm -hmm. OCD behaviours. Joe says, eating unhealthy, not caring much doing what I, what my body doesn't want, not sleeping properly. I'm trying to think what, I think my, my main forms of self-punishment are these days, they're cognitive. It's just my inner critic on bad days just still goes off and tells me, you know, that I'm not a very nice person or not a good mother. Or I should be doing this and that and should be doing better. And I don't know, what about you, Alexis? Do you relate to that? I related, I was thinking on the rewards and I definitely use coffee as a reward. <laughs> I think both of us do that. <laughs> yes, yes, but the punishment is, uh, and I can relate to that subtle insidious form of punishment uh, that um, oh, I know I'm guilty of with ex-partners rather than just opening up a conversation in for the sake of understanding yeah, the manipulation is probably how I would have used punishment in the past. And I agree, it always feels terrible. It always feels icky and uncomfortable and like something is just not sitting well. And that's the so, test, you know, to answer the question, how do you tell the difference between punishing and setting boundaries? The test is in the body. It feels different. Yes. Setting a boundary compassionately but very firmly and clearly that feels quite good. You know, it feels kind of solid, solid. empowering, empowering, right? fortifying, clarifying often. Yes. Whereas using punishment energy or even reward energy, as you say, it just doesn't feel very good. It feels sticky, messy, uh, icky. Yeah, like I'm Anx twisting myself. Anxiety provoking. Yes. Stressful. Yeah. <laughs> And that there's going to be a snowball effect. <laughs> That's right. And then you start worrying like, oh, my God, what's going to happen next? You know, 
yeah and you feel guilty like all there's all sorts of cues in the body as well as the mind about the difference so just track that in yourself you'll get to know it over time I love that Mia acknowledges how raw this is yes um, it is and and that interesting comment on um yeah, punishing ourselves once we've been open I know I, ha I have related to that in the past too Mia uh, and so me too. me too it's called a vulnerability hangover <laughs> the next day you start going oh my god I said too much why did they say that and it does get easier right it gets easier uh, I was very vulnerable at a presentation yesterday and I had no hangover for the first time so it's taken yeah well you know <clears throat> it's taken about 12 or 18 months to get there, but um, it's possible. Mm. Let's get on to empathy because I'm keen to soak up your suggestions for <clears throat> brewing a more empathic existence uh, and, and how to cultivate self-compassion, please. So first of all, yeah, I think sometimes we have to manage our physiology. Because very often punishment and coercion to so the desire to cause pain or hurt to someone else or to the desire to make them behave we, the way we want them to, all very human, uh, because all very human because it comes out of dysregulation. It comes out of having a physiological and emotional state that's in fight flight, mm -hmm. you know, that's um, heightened stress and anxiety, hurt and pain survival right survival right i mean so like forgive yourself because this is coming from your survival mechanisms anything that's trying to help you survive can't be all bad right yeah. it's just not effective so the first thing we need to do and this is often the most challenging bit right is to wait it out and calm yourself you know bring yourself down settle yourself find a way to discharge this energy instead of taking it all out on somebody else or yourself mm. so there are a multitude of ways as we know and it's probably good to come up with your own list if you don't like meditation or yoga Maybe you like walking. Maybe you like going to the gym. Maybe you go swimming. Maybe you need to call someone and just talk for an hour and get all the energy out that way. Make a list of the ways that you can discharge some of this energy or at least let it settle or both so that it doesn't end up getting acted out in a coercive or punishing way to somebody that maybe doesn't deserve it or who you care about mm. and then once you've settled yourself down which could take an hour or it could take a day or it could take a week or it could take longer it depends on the size of the you know the amount of triggering yeah. and be patient with yourself it might take a while depending on how triggered you are mm. Then you want to ask yourself, what am I actually feeling? Because in the whirlpool of distress, it's hard to identify the more subtle underlying feelings like disappointment, like sadness, like fear, mm -hmm. um, like hurt. You know, so when you've settled yourself down, you can ask yourself, what am I actually feeling? Maybe write that down. Get a feelings list and identify and name what the actual feelings are. This is, we keep coming back to this all the time, yeah. right? And, and then what is it that I really need? Because the mind will tell a story. I need that other person too. Mm -hmm. And that's the coercion and punishment. Mm. I, I need my child to behave better. Mm. I need my boss to treat me better. I need my partner to stop drinking. And it's very understandable when we're really upset that the mind goes to strategies that other people need to enact. But when we're calmer, we can say, what do I actually need? Now, I might get the answer to that question quickly, or I might not. I've had to sit with that question sometimes for days and days and days and days. Mm, I love hearing that. It's so human and so real and true. It's like, I've been so distressed or confused or whatever, like, what do I actually need here? And I won't normally be able to answer that question until I've restored some degree of calm. Mm. But when I can get clear on 
more deeply what I'm feeling and what my needs are, my values, Mm -hmm. then I'm empowered. You know, Mm -hmm. then I can express that or then I can take action or maybe then the action is I'm able to let go to some degree to create peace, Mm -hmm. self-empowerment. Maybe that's one of my needs is Mm -hmm. some self-connection, some self-compassion or some peace. And maybe only I can do that. But even I don't realize that or see that when I'm really dysregulated. So that's why step one of self-soothing is absolutely crucial. Rachel, that is such a great formula. Uh, Excuse me just for one moment. Um, I would love to just reiterate that for our listeners because I think you've just given a really clear step-by-step process uh, to break the pattern of self-punishment and replace it with self-compassion and uh, what a fundamental place to work. So what I've heard you say, and please correct any any bits that are not true to say, um, and I will have to sign off straight after this, but um, the first step you've suggested is settling and soothing and allowing the time that is necessary for that to happen. Yeah. And sometimes if it's a big issue, it may take up to a week. You know, it can take time to let things settle down. It takes as long as it takes. Yes. And uh, the only thing I wanted to add to that is that that's where the tolerance comes in too, to be able to be with the discomfort rather than push it away, which will only drag out the process as we know. Yeah. Then once things have settled, we can ask, what am I actually feeling? And I love the suggestion of using a list because seeing it in written form or writing it ourselves is quite quite a, an awesome process in itself. I loved the post you made of journaling with the, the scrambled head and then before journaling she's got a scrambled head and then after journaling that big scramble is on the page. It's such a, such a simple step. Get it out of here and onto there, yeah. Yes. Then what is it that I actually need? And again, allowing as much time for that as possible. And that's, again, where we're holding it on a page can be helpful to keep it forefront of mind. What, what, what do I need? And even giving myself some suggestions. And then I'm in a, an empowered place to either express, you make a request um, or to, to act for myself or if necessary, let go. Yeah. It's a really complete process. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it is. And um you know, it takes a lot of slowing down. I can't access my deeper feelings and needs unless I slow down. And that's the point of our practice group, monthly practice groups is to provide a safe space where we can come together as a group or, and work in pairs and slow down out of the normal fast paced conversational mode of this culture and really be present and relax into Uh, and dive into those deeper feelings and needs Mm, yes relaxation go hand in hand relaxation goes hand in hand with feelings and needs I would have to agree yeah and on that I'll post um a couple of links below one to our practice group and uh another for anyone who's interested is um I'm, I'm hosting a well I'm not hosting I'm leading an ecstatic dance which is actually actually a uh, a movement-based practice um, that I have personally found incredibly valuable for uh, for releasing, for discharging, uh, even quite quite deep uh, release. Um, so uh, I'll post that link for anybody who's interested to attend that one. I intend to be there. Wonderful. Yes. Well, I look forward to seeing your moves. <laughs> Oh, actually not. We actually don't look at each other. Like it's, okay. we're really in our own space. So that, don't that, makes, that makes me feel a lot better. I would love to see you move some other time. <laughs> and um, is there anything else you would like to say before we close off? Uh, I'm just thinking, this is me thinking out loud on the spot. I haven't even mentioned this to you, Alexis, but I'm thinking of running a weekly dyad process for anybody on Zoom who... A, a mutual friend of ours, Murray, and I did a dyad process for an hour last night on Zoom. And again, it reminded me the importance of slowing way down so that we can access our feelings, our mm-hmm. deeper feelings and our needs, dive under the 
anxiety or anger or whatever it might be, agitation, the stress, we want to get underneath that to something a bit softer and a bit deeper and a bit more meaningful, I suppose. And I remembered again, as I've, we always forget, don't we, as humans, that that requires slowing down. Anyway, so I'll talk to you more about the possibility of doing a dyad process with our listeners, which means on Zoom with one other person in breakout rooms, doing a process with another human that helps you do this very work that we're talking about. Yeah, it's uh, it's like nothing else. I'm so there. Okay, <laughs> okay. and the last yeah. Sunday, the last Sunday of this month is our practice group. That's right. Yes, yeah. so please show up. We would love to meet you, see you, share with you, practice with you in the flesh. Yes. Thank you again, Dr. Rachel. Beautiful session today. Thank you, and we'll see you all next Sunday. Ciao. Good night. Bye. Bye.